In this talk, we'll tackle six common questions about breast imaging, beginning with, why do we use mammography and tomoth synthesis for breast cancer screening instead of, say, a standard x-ray or CT scan? Fundamentally, there are three kinds of imaging studies we do in healthcare that use x-ray beams. Standard radiography, which we colloquially refer to as x-rays, conventional tomography, and computed tomography, better known as a CT or CAT scan. A standard radiograph or x-ray is like a photo you get from a point-and-shoot camera. The three-dimensional world is collapsed into a two-dimensional image, and almost everything in the image, whether it was near or far from your camera, appears sharp and in focus. If you're familiar with photography, you'd refer to this as an image with a deep depth of field, the sort of image you get with a small aperture or high f-stop. Conventional tomograms, in contrast, are like a photo with a narrow depth of field, the kind of photo you're more likely to see from a fancy SLR camera that permits you to shoot an image with a large aperture or low f-stop. While objects located at a specific focal plane away from your camera are sharp and in focus, everything either shallow or deep to that plane appears out of focus and blurry. The cool thing with conventional tomograms is that you can shoot the image at different depths of field, which permit you to get some 3D insights you wouldn't get from a standard radiograph. You're also able to reduce some of the effects of superimposition too, since objects deep or shallow to a particular focal plane are partly out of focus and blurred out. Computer tomography, or CT however, is very different from a conventional tomogram. Instead of an image like this, where the Columbia Blue phonograph cylinder is in focus and everything shallow or deep to it appears blurry, on a CT image, you would only see items in the particular plane as the Columbia Blue phonograph cylinder in this image, and nothing shallow or deep to that plane. While some people refer to both conventional tomograms and CT as 3D imaging techniques, as you can see, they are clearly not the same. Let's look at how an organ like the kidney appears on a standard x-ray, a conventional tomogram, and CT. Notice how a conventional tomogram image shares some aspects with a standard x-ray image, but also some aspects with a CT image. Unlike the standard radiograph image, we don't have bow gas and ribs partially obscuring the kidney on a conventional tomogram image. That's because the conventional tomogram image has a narrow depth of field, and the bow gas and ribs are in a different imaging plane than the kidney, and therefore out of focus. The reason we don't see the bow gas and ribs in the case of a CT image is different. In the case of CT, the bow gas and ribs are just entirely missing since they're not in the plane of a particular CT image slice, like this one. Notice that while you can't discern the edge of the kidney on the standard x-ray image, you can see it on the conventional tomogram image and you can see it really well on the CT image. Also notice how you can distinguish the different densities of liver, fat, and kidney on conventional tomography much better than on a standard radiograph, though not quite as dramatically as on the CT image. One weakness of CT, however, is the lower spatial resolution of CT images. Notice how our ability to resolve the fine details and texture of the kidney stone on these images is best on the x-ray, so-so on the conventional tomogram image, and much more limited on the CT image. Many of these observations translate to imaging of the breast. Compare the left image, which is a radiograph obtained via standard TD, 2D mammography, versus the center image, which is a stack of conventional tomogram images obtained via breast tomosynthesis. The stack of tomogram images is displayed as a movie, which each, with each frame corresponding to a different depth of field. Notice how easily we can see this small object on the tomosynthesis images compared to a standard 2D mammogram image, or this blood vessel. When it comes to imaging any body part in radiology, four common options usually include standard x-ray, conventional tomography, CT, and MRI. Each modality has different advantages and disadvantages. 
while CT offers much better soft tissue contrast and much less anatomic superimposition compared to x-rays and conventional tomography, its spatial resolution is poorer and the amount of ionizing radiation exposure required to make an image much, much higher. MRI offers minimal anatomic superimposition, outstanding soft tissue contrast, and no ionizing radiation. However, its spatial resolution is even poorer than CT. Although modalities like X-ray and conventional tomography may not provide outstanding soft tissue contrast, they can offer excellent spatial resolution and require pretty low amounts of ionizing radiation. When it comes to imaging a body part like, like the breast, three of these modalities are practical options. Radiography via standard 2D mammography, breast tomosynthesis, and breast MRI. Breast CT is not a viable option for screening because one, the ionizing radiation doses are high enough that we might begin to worry about inducing more breast cancers than we were diagnosing if we were to image a woman every year with CT or more. Two, the resolution is too poor to see some of the fine, tiny calcifications that form in some breast cancers. And three, the soft tissue contrast isn't quite good enough to characterize other breast cancers. In practice, standard 2D mammography and breast tomosynthesis are the main workhorses of breast imaging. Breast MRIs tend to be a troubleshooting modality used judiciously in a small number of specific scenarios. Not only do breast MRIs take a much longer time to perform, they're also plagued by lower specificity and lower sensitivity in some women, which can sometimes generate more questions than answers. So that's why we predominantly rely on standard 2D mammography and breast tomosynthesis. How does 2D mammography work? Let's say we wanted to x-ray the breast the typical way we x-ray practically every other body part, like this. This wouldn't work too well since a substantial amount of other structures like the chest wall, lungs, and heart would partly obscure our ability to see breast tissue. And superimposition wouldn't be our only problem. In order for x-ray photons to make it through the breast and the rest of the chest to form an image on the x-ray detector panel, we'd have to make sure the x-ray photons were of pretty high energy. Since x-ray soft tissue interactions are dictated more by the Compton effect than the photoelectric effect at higher photon energies, we'd lose a substantial amount of soft tissue imaging contrast. That means that small differences in soft tissue density, the kind we might rely on to visually detect a breast cancer, would be tough to discern. This is why we there is very little detail we can perceive in a woman's breast on many standard x-rays, like this one. So, trying, the, trying to x-ray the breast like this doesn't work. What might work better would be to x-ray the breast from top down or cranial caudally or medial laterally in an oblique plane. These two approaches avoid having to shoot through a lot of other superimposed anatomy. Now, usually our practice in radiology is to obtain orthogonal views of whatever we're x-raying 90 degrees apart. So why don't we do this for the breast? Well, hold that thought for just a moment and I promise I'll answer that question in under three minutes. For now, let's go back to that craniocaudal or CC view of the breast. If we were to image the breast exactly like this, we'd encounter a problem with our image. The amount of breast tissue X-ray photons pass through would be different in the center of the breast compared to the edge of the breast, which means that different parts of the breast would be either relatively under or overexposed. In addition, there'd be a lot more superimposed breast tissue in the center of the breast, which could make interpreting anatomy and other findings tougher than near the edge of the breast. That's why we use paddles to compress the breast into a slab so that it's thinner and also of relatively uniform thickness when we image it. If we compress each breast into a slab of relative uniform thickness and x-ray them, we get a pair of cranial caudal mammograms that look like this. When we display cranial caudal or CC mammograms of both breasts, this is the convention we use. 
the mammograms are displayed so that the lateral armpit side of both breasts are at the top of our display, the sternal side of both breasts are at the bottom of our display, and the nipples point away from each other. Let's move on to the mediolateral oblique or MLO view. Now, when we look at a breast from the front, it's important to understand that the breast is actually not circular. A breast is actually shaped more like this with a tail that points towards the armpit. And the tail of the breast in the breast's upper outer quadrant happens to also be a common site where breast cancers occur. Compressing the breast in an MLO orientation gives us a much better chance at inspecting the tail of the breast than if we were to use a true mediolateral or ML orientation. If we tried to compress the breast in a true ML view orthogonal to the CC view, we would not be able to compress the tail of the breast and inspect it well. When we display mediolateral oblique or MLO mammograms of both breasts, this is the convention we use. The mammograms are displayed so that the upper portion of both breasts are at the top of the display, the lower portion of both breasts are at the bottom of the display, and the nipples point away from each other. So, how does breast tomosynthesis work? Here's the typical setup of a conventional 2D mammogram. I'll choose the CC view. With tomosynthesis in the CC view, the overall setup is similar. However, the X-ray tube moves in a short arc above the breast and multiple low-dose images of the breast are obtained at different points in this arc. The aggregate radiation dose associated with a tomosynthesis acquisition ends up being between one to two times the amount of a standard 2D mammogram acquisition. A computer then takes all of these images acquired from different points in the arc, does some processing, and creates a stack of CC images, each at a different depth of field or plane of focus, typically one millimeter apart. While a standard 2D mammogram study usually results in four images, one CC and one MLO view of each breast, Tomosynthesis results in many, many more images to look at. Since tomosynthesis images of the breast are generated at focal planes one millimeter apart, and the average breast is around 60 millimeters thick when compressed, you're dealing with around 60 images for one view of one breast. Since we'll do tomosynthesis stacks in the CC and MLO views for both breasts, you're talking about almost 250 images. And in women with large breasts, the images may be much more. You may be interested to learn that there are 86 individual images in the tomosynthesis stack that's currently running on this slide. By the way, notice how something as subtle as the patient's skin pores come into outstanding focus on some of these images as we move through the stack. In many practices, both 2D mammogram images and tomosynthesis images are used for interpretation. While the 2D mammography images and tomosynthesis images may be individually acquired, with newer equipment, 2D mammography images can be synthetically generated from the tomosynthesis acquisitions, which cuts down both study time and radiation exposure. Compared to standard 2D mammography images, synthetic 2D mammography images appear slightly more contrasty. But the medical literature suggests that synthetic 2D mammograms are of equivalent diagnostic performance compared to standard 2D mammograms. So how do 2D mammography and tomosynthesis compare diagnostically? There are many different imaging features that radiologists are looking for when trying to detect a breast cancer. They may look for a mass, strictly defined as a density visible on two different projections that exhibits convex outward margins and is denser in its center than its periphery. When inspecting a mass, the radiologist will pay particular attention to its shape, margin, and density. A radiologist trying to detect breast cancer also carefully inspects for any asymmetries, basically a density in the breast that doesn't quite meet the criteria for a mass. A radiologist trying to detect a breast cancer also looks for suspicious architectural distortion of breast tissue and for 
suspicious tiny microcalcifications, paying special attention to their morphology and distribution. These factors in aggregate influence a radiologist's suspicion for breast cancer. While 2D mammography can catch many breast cancers, it's certainly not 100% sensitive. A significant subset of breast cancers may not be perceptible on 2D mammography, particularly in women with dense breasts. Non-calcified breast cancers, for example, could be obscured by other superimposed soft tissue in some of these situations. Tomosynthesis affords radiologists with a tool to partly overcome some of this sort of masking, which helps in women with dense breasts. While tomosynthesis can improve our sensitivity and specificity with respect to non-calcified breast lesions, it doesn't seem to offer substantial improvement over standard 2D mammograms when it comes to breast cancers diagnosed based on suspicious calcified features, probably since calcifications are very dense and therefore less susceptible to being obscured by superimposed soft tissues in the first place. What does this mean for patients? Research shows that tomosynthesis can increase our overall sensitivity for detecting invasive breast cancers. When compared to 2D MAMO, use of tomosynthesis resulted in an over 50% increase in breast cancer detection rate in a 2016 study published in radiology, though no significant difference was observed with regards to non-invasive breast cancers, the ones that more often present by their suspicious microcalcifications. In the Oslo breast cancer screening trial, Use of 2D mammography and tomosynthesis resulted in an increase in the detection of invasive and non-invasive breast cancers compared to 2D mammography alone, while also reducing false positives. Similar results were reported in a 2014 JAMA study. Because of its ability to reduce false positives, another impact of tomosynthesis may be to reduce recalls, particularly in women getting their first mammogram women with scattered fibroglandular breast opacities, and women with heterogeneously dense breasts. While prevailing recall rates for 2D MAMO hover around 7-10%, the use of tomosynthesis can reduce this amount by around 15%. Because tomosynthesis improves radiologists' ability to perceive some of the three-dimensional relationships within a patient's breast, some of the additional views needed when planning Breast biopsies can also be avoided. Use cases for tomosynthesis currently include both screening and diagnostic mammography. Tomosynthesis can be used for many supplemental views and spot compression views, though not for mag views. Tomosynthesis can also be employed in some stereotactic biopsies as well. So, how do radiologists handle reading all of these images? Breast imaging practices across the United States currently vary in their use of tomosynthesis. Not too long ago, I checked in on some of my friends who do breast imaging here in California and learned that different practices do different things. Some often use only 2D mammography in their practice, some use only tomosynthesis, while others used both, and in those practices, there were differences in whether the 2D mammograms were acquired conventionally or synthetically from the tomosynthesis acquisitions. In settings relying on only 2D mammograms, a radiologist may start their interpretation by viewing a panorama of the patient's four current and four prior 2D mammogram images. Each 2D image is carefully inspected and compared to the contralateral breast in the same view and on the same date, and compared to the same breast in the same view on a prior date. Here's how it might work. A panorama of eight 2D mammography images is presented. Prior CC views of both breasts and prior ML views, MLO views of both breasts along the top row and current CC views of both breasts and current MLO views of both breasts along the bottom row. Each of the four current views are then viewed full size with the same view of the same breast from prior displayed next to it, starting with a right CC view, then a left CC view, 
then a right MLO view, and finally a left MLO view. The radiologist returns to the panorama and is free to go back and inspect any of these images again as they choose. Here's a different viewing protocol. In this protocol, a panorama of eight 2D mammography images are presented as before, and then the current CC views of both breasts may be displayed full size. The radiologist may then toggle back and forth between the current view and prior view of the right breast, and then toggle back and forth between the current and prior view of the left breast. The process is then repeated for the MLO views. In settings where 2D mammography and tomosynthesis are both used, the workflow changes a little. Studies containing tomosynthesis images are often interpreted on proprietary vendor-specific workstations with unique UXs, UIs, and physical interfaces, though sometimes these studies may be interpreted on general-purpose PAC systems too. In general, a panorama of eight 2D mammography images are presented as before, and the radiologist might inspect each 2D memo image and then refer to the corresponding tomo of the same breast and in the same view as they proceed. Here's one example of a workflow incorporating both 2D memo and tomo synthesis images. A panorama of eight 2D memo images are presented, and then the focus changes to the current CC and current MLO 2D memo images. Each view is inspected and toggled against the same view of the same breast from prior. The layout may then change to a four-on-one presentation with the current Tomo CC view of the right breast, the current 2D CC view of the right breast, the current 2D CC view of the left breast, and the current Tomo view, Tomo CC view of the left breast, followed by a similar presentation of the current Tomo MLO views and 2D MLO views of both breasts. Patient interpretations that incorporate both 2D MAMO images and Tomo synthesis images take around twice as long to interpret as a traditional 2D only study. Settings that solely use tomosynthesis with no 2D MAMO images tend to be the ones where a couple of years of prior Tomo images are available for comparison. In these settings, thick 10 millimeter Tomo slabs are, are often also generated, which are used for microcalcification detection, since microcalcifications are tough to see with a one millimeter focal zone thickness. A panorama of eight Tomo images is presented. Prior Tomo CC views of both breasts, prior Tomo MLO views of both breasts along the top row, and current Tomo CC views of both breasts and current Tomo MLO views of both breasts along the bottom row. The current CC Tomo view of the right breast may be interpreted at full size against a prior CC Tomo view of the right breast, followed by an assessment of the corresponding 10 millimeter thick slabs. And the process is repeated with the Tomo CC view of the left breast. The Tomo MLO view, o view of the right breast. And the Tomo MLO view of the left breast. Use of tomosynthesis is not universal and influenced by several factors. Some women are well informed and proactively request or seek out tomosynthesis because they have dense breasts, they're aware of the lower recall rates, and the improved sensitivity of tomosynthesis. They may also be open to it because they know that the tomosynthesis experience is not substantially different than what they'd experience with a traditional 2D MAMO study. In the United States, multiple vendors offer FDA-approved tomosynthesis solutions, 
However, systems can be costly to implement, which curtails deployment in some resource-constrained settings. The capital costs of deploying tomosynthesis aren't just the cost of the equipment, but may also include electrical or other utility upgrades required to support this new equipment, accessories, and accreditation. Additional funding may also be required to expand existing ultrasound services, too. Since tomosynthesis picks up more soft tissue abnormalities than 2D MAMO, usually more breast ultrasounds will need to be performed to investigate them, which requires more ultrasound technologist staffing to do the scanning and more ultrasound machines to do the ultrasounds. And there may be the additional cost of radiologist staffing as well. Although tomosynthesis may reduce recall rates, this usually does not offset the amount of extra time required to interpret each patient's complete study. Because of these factors, the deployment of tomosynthesis is often not universal and may be more targeted or heterogeneous. A practice may, for example, use tomosynthesis just for screeners, or just for diagnostics, or just for baseline studies, or just for women with dense breasts, or only when requested. Which naturally leads to a discussion of possible exclusion criteria for tomosynthesis too. Generally, potential exclusion criteria that have been discussed include patients with comorbidities, preventing them from staying physically still during the longer image acquisition time of a tomosynthesis study, women over 70 years of age, very large patients, and patients who have pacemakers or breast implants.